You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Welcome to the Bitter Medicine Podcast, where it's all about black empowerment. Our show focuses on black news and entertainment, arts, science, economics, history, people, and strategies that uplift, empower, and motivate Africans within the diaspora. And now, your host, whose favorite color is black, Goku. Welcome back, everybody, to the Bitter Medicine Podcast. I am your host, Koku, here today continuing the reading on nation building, theory and practice in African-centered education. Before we get rolling with this reading tonight, let me remind you guys that this show is part of a podcast network. You are invited to check out some of the other shows KWAZ Radio. This is D Webb with the Harsh Reality Podcast. Ask you to tune in where we tackle the news of the day that affects our community only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni inviting you to listen to the pro black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. Greetings, fam. Tune in to The Learning Curve with me, the Revolutionary Matron on KWAZ Radio. You are listening to The Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Yes, indeed. Make sure you guys are subscribed to all of the other shows on uh, KWAZ Radio, subscribe to their YouTube channels, click the bell to be notified when they have new content going up. And when they drop new stuff, make sure to hit them a like, <clears throat> drop a comment, let people know, let the folks know that you're listening, you're in tune with what they're doing, All right? So drop comments. We always appreciate comments here, KWAZ. All right, uh, with that said, um, Let's get into continuing this reading. Again, we're reading Nation Building by Okoto, Theory and Practice in African Centered Education. And we're, the last few weeks of this reading, we've been building up towards the African Centered Curriculum. We're laying the groundwork each time we do this reading. And I think it's super important. You guys are appreciating this groundwork that the book is, is laying. Hit one in the chat. Hit one in the channel. Let let other folks know that hey, yeah, I'm I'm feeling this. I'm feeling this this build up to the African Center curriculum. So we left off last time on this section called Family, Culture, Community. So here's where we're going to continue at tonight. This school year has begun with record numbers record numbers again. The level of interest from all sectors of the community exceeded our capacity and expectations for all divisions. Cursory survey of other area schools indicates similar levels of interest. These levels of interest have not been seen since the early 70s. The motivating elements then, as now, involve a balance of three major factors, cultural or racial awareness, academic achievement, and an emotionally nurturing environment. In addition to a nurturing environment for the children, many parents are themselves looking for an environment that is culturally enriching and intellectually stimulating. These factors in combination make up for the type of community that was characteristic of the African hamlets and townships in the American South before the massive urban migration and the consequent breakup of families and clans that made up those communities. What was expected of the youth in those communities was essentially the same as what we expect today in the independent African-centered schools that form the center of the new urban Afrocentric cultural communities. Older communities sought to impart some sense of community and racial allegiance as well as provide the youth with the best education possible. Similarly, the independent independent African-centered schools 
such as Nation House Positive Action Center and Uyama in Washington, African People's Action School in Trenton, New Concept Development Center and Shul Ya Watoto in Chicago. Functioning as community centers or cultural focal points have as their mission the provision of an educational experience that will guarantee that the students is challenged to fulfill his or her intellectual potential and is able to function in any environment, be it hostile or not. Mission goes beyond that of the old community schools, seeking not only to instill racial pride, but additionally to inspire a commitment to reconstructing and expanding our communities, the African world, in a way that is consistent with our racial and cultural heritage. The qualitative difference is that the older communities were limited by the socio-political conditions of the time to a defensive posture. The mission of the contemporary African Center schools must be to take that mission to the level of an intergenerational crusade, but nothing short of full self-determination for the race. The key determinants of the vitality of those old communities were the cohesion provided by the shared culture, the value placed on family. Culture and family are the two elements that must also be at the center of our efforts here at Nation House. Cultural or ideal ideological orientation of the school must be clear to every member of the community. We must further understand that our membership requires an active role, active not only in work, but also active in intellectual and cultural growth. We must grow as our children grow. The school community must grow and expand as a family whose sense of direction and whose cohesion intensified over the course of sustained and consistent work and study, disappointment and triumph. Our perspective on our personal conditions and the future condition of the race must be one of ultimate triumph regardless of reoccurring setbacks. What that perspective speaks to is faith or Imani, that faith in our ultimate victory and the clear vision of what it is we are working for, both individually and collectively, will assure our final continuing success. It brings us to a section called expectation. Expectation. Yeah, when we do work like this, there are certain expectations you're supposed to want to meet. Let's see what. Last week, two very different circumstances produced two related and immediately relevant concepts. An editorial in a recent edition of the local centrist liberal newspaper by a politically neutral this Negro uh, columnist on the limitations of Afrocentric education was the source of the first principle. The second principle stemmed from an observation made during one of our weekly staff meetings. The first principle involves the role, if any, that the awareness of African history plays in stimulating the intellectual appetite and facilitating the character development of African youth. The second principle involves a much written about and often misunderstood principle of the expectations we have of our children, classroom, our homes, and in life. The two are linked in a way that can elucidate and expand on both Afrocentric education and our roles as teachers and parents. The linkage between the two concepts can be simplistically understood in terms of who expects, how they expect, and finally, what they expect. The three queries, who, how, and what, can be further described as three crises that confront us as parents, as teachers, as families, as a community, as a nation, and as a race. Those crises are respectively the crisis of identity, crisis of action, crisis of goals. Expectations is a simple word that carries with it a number of underlying assumptions that should be examined. In order to understand how expectations as a concept are so important to us as parents and teachers, to say expectations is the first ask whose expectations or who expects. This question of the identity of the who must be clearly answered. The average African American, this constitutes the first of three crises, crisis of identity. The question of who can only be answered by re resorting to history, cultural continuum that defines the family, individual, community, the nation, and the race. And herein lies the importance of our first concept, history and national or racial culture play a crucial role in character formation. The second assumption reflects the second query, 
that of how we expect. To have an, to, to have an expectation implies an action. The action of expecting an imperative, a request, or a fantasy. The expectations we hold and actions we take regarding our progeny, or our community and race for that matter, can be firm and resolute. They can be vague and ambiguous, or they can be ethereal and non-existent. It's here in the very nature of expecting, whether within the family, the community, or the race, that we have a crisis of action. And we see this on the continent too, by the way. Right? The determining factor for any single way of expecting, imperative, uh, request, fantasy, is the relative viability of the cultural identity, which will be determined largely by the historical continuum, people's consciousness or awareness of that continuum, and the culture that flows from it. For example, if the level of cultural awareness and allegiance among the people is weakened and non-viable, then the expectations relative to the culture will be equally weak and more like unspoken requests and fantasies. The real imperative will flow from the culturally, socially, economically, politically dominant group and will work to the benefit of that group simultaneously to the detriment and destruction of the weaker culture. Beyond the question of how we expect, is the third assumption or question that underlies the concept of expectations. That question is one of the is one of the object or goal of the action what we expect. We expect many things of our children. Those expectations may be categorized in ways that are consistent with the implied action underlying them. Those categories are three, first of which includes goals of focused continuity. It's in this first category we are concerned to establish or reaffirm a continuum that in turn reaffirms a definite identity, interest, or focus. Expectations of this type will lead to nationhood and self-determination. Let me read that again. Expectations of this type will lead to nationhood and self-determination. The second category includes goals of accommodation, compromise. In this category, we are interested to achieve those ends that are non-controversial, that do not result in any perceived alienation or adversarial intentionality. We are here willing to concede large measures of self-identity or self-interest in order to avoid potential alienation. Expectations like these led our centrist Negro columnists to the erroneous su supposition that African-centered education cannot provide for the development of African youth. The third and final category is that of, inter, uh, is that of um, indeterminate goals or, go or goals of chaos. There is no explicit or even implied statement of objectives that flows from either a distinct cultural continuum or identity or a well-defined interest. Behaviors typically of this category include parents who choose to initiate careers and personal interests full-time during their child's formative years, that's from birth to 21, without adequate provisions for the child's spiritual, emotional, and moral development. Those things can't be bought. Our initial concept was the role of African history in stimulating intellectual development and achievement. A mistaken assumption that our centrist columnists made, that many educators, uh, educators make, is that effective African-centered education can be broken into discrete components packaged and administered by anyone, cannot be. It is important to place the history of African people at the center of the Afrocentric education. Culture and ideologies that are born of that history must be given equal importance. Additionally, cultural or ideological alignment of the teacher, parent, and school must be treated equally. That African-centered educational process is to be truly effective then the teacher and the school must be one with that history, that culture. Efficiency of the elite Eurocentric schools, the homogeneous Japanese schools, are evidence of the efficacy of the statement. If our children are to perform academically, morally, and culturally, and the expectations that we have of them must, in the first instance, be informed by the level of our own historical or cultural awareness and actions. We are truly confident 
of the of the validity and worth of our ancestors' achievements. We are firm in our identity within our cultural heritage and committed to its uh, recovery, refinement, and perpetuation. Then our expectations of our children will be firmly and resolutely directed toward the goals of family, community, national reconstruction, and self-determination. These conditions met, we'll be, we will be assured of our children's and our people's survival prosperity. This brings us to a section called Paradigm. You know, one thing I'll just say here briefly is that only to say had an episode of his show this past Sunday where he's kind of revealing the open secret of how white folks dominate. An open secret is that these folks read, these folks invest in, 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 uh, in reading material. And historically, what they've also done too is they've said that they, they have had expectations of their children wherein they can be college educated or in the process of college education at earlier ages than what we really expect. Like 15, um, a man, uh, what's his name? Adam Smith uh, was in college and rubbing shoulders with some of the preeminent European philosophers and stuff like that at a young age, right? And only Tassay made a point that I that I believe in truly. The reality of it is you get to a child's mind early and you use the proper technique how to get to their minds, how to unlock their genius, right? Uh, how to unlock their understanding. You could actually train folks to be doctors, lawyers, and whatnot coming out of high school. You know, by 18, folks can, can be able to do this stuff. But we have this belief, and it's because we are following these white folks, as only Tassay pointed out, because we're following these European guys. We leave our kids in schools until they're, well, in America, it's like till they're like 18, right? 17, 18. In the Caribbean, most folks get out like around 16, right, of high school. Um, so it's something that we have to consider that first to begin with, we have to understand that our children are capable, capable, and you coddling them or thinking that they can't do certain stuff because they protest. That's what kids do. Kids protest, right? You have to find the way though. It's not just. And I grew up around this type of stuff. It's not just a shouting at a kid to get it. No, there's, there's techniques, there's ways, and, th and that's what we need to be investing in. We need to be investing in the understanding, right, of how to get through to our kids at young ages. I read a paper some time ago that talked about, like, the rites of passage, the fact that Africans traditionally didn't baby even what we would call babies. Like by the time you were 13 and stuff, you kind of knew pretty much what adults knew. They had those rites of passage, right? That you were a man by like 13 years old, essentially. Young woman by, by a similar age. They didn't hide information thinking, oh, it's too much for a young. No, nah, they, they exposed you to what it was you were going to be exposed to anyway as a functioning full adult in African society. We are essentially playing a part, dumbing down our kids. And I've played the part too. I'm not here to pretend that I haven't, uh, sacrificed you know certain things at times for career and this that and the other entrepreneurship etc right but this is what we've uh, accepted 
And this is what we got to change. We have to change the systems. We have to change the paradigm that we follow to continue. We're in a section called Paradigms. In this section, we are beginning with notes on African centered pedagogy. African centeredness as a worldview, as a comprehensive cultural whole, presages an African centered education, uh, which in turn entails the elaboration of an African centered pedagogy. The African centered pedagogy is a studied, vigorous, and creative elaboration of the fundamental precepts of African culture and ideology, in the area of teaching methodology, pedagogy of African centeredness, like African, like African centeredness itself, it's not a simple negation of the hegemonic assumptions of Eurocentric pedagogical theory. African centered pedagogy is concerned with the acquisition of self determination, self sufficiency for African people, but ultimately with truth. Afrocentric mission is to humanize the universe. The elaboration of an African-centered pedagogy must begin with a description of the historical and political economic context in which the discussion occurs. The African nationalist dynamic that underlies African centeredness has always been prominent in popular sentiment and the social philosophy of the African population and its leadership. Historically, Africans in America have uh, vacillated between nationalist and assimilationist sociopolitical sentiment. New resurgence and popular expression of this nationalist sentiment, very much like the current nationalist stru uh, struggles of our brethren in Southern Africa, as indeed the two struggles have paralleled each other for very nearly a century, have been linked for that same period. The African nationalist struggles parallel the resurgence of the repressed national cultures of Eastern Europe and throughout Asia, a plethora of voices emanating from a disintegrating Soviet Union, and the resurgent militancy of the Amerindians. The era of pluralistic cultural or nationalist expression coincides not, co not incidentally with a leveling of the international political economic landscape era of the unipolar, bipolar, and tripolar superpower nations, whose whims determine the course of world events has come to an unceremonious end. Failure and collapse of one European political, political economy based on Marxism, socialism, and communism. Fragmentation and reordering of the other, capitalism, has facilitated the flowering of long dormant and repressed nationalism. This leveling of the socio-economic and cultural landscape of a world order has occasioned the flowering of national cultures that have therefore been systematically repressed and stifled by both the Marxist and the liberal democratic regimes of the West. Both are European-centered phenomena. Both have reaped gross profits from the Eurocentric hegemony in international affairs in cultural, political, and economic spheres. That repression has been accomplished through methods of, of methods of simple brute force, such as military invasion and occupation, enslavement, forced migration, genocide, illegalization of language and tradition, post structural dependency and political repression, and secondly, by methods of mental manipulation, such as religious indoctrination and mystification, miseducation, racist scholarship, institutionalized racism, cultural repression, and inferiorization and mass propaganda. Oof. Well said. The consequence of both methods has been psychic and spiritual negation of the dominated people. But methods of repression have been cloaked in self-serving accommodationist myths, such as the melting pot, common culture, democratic or federalist ideal, universal cultural ideal, etc. The expression of nationalist or ethnocentrist sentiments by those repressed nationalities have been and still are greeted with charges of separatism, reverse racism, setting racial animosity, misguided militancy, balkanization, narrow nationalism, etc. 
defenders of the American ideal of common citizenship of the multi-ethnic society revel in the collapse of socialism, the quote-unquote evil empire, but are blind to the West legacy of genocide, enslavement, pillage against Africans and Amerindians, having camouflaged and denuded the psychic and moral significance in the tapestry, lights, and sounds of Hollywood and TV merrymaking. It is that same merrymaking propaganda machine that has dulled the thinking capacity of the general population on mass depolitization and civic cowardice, thereby seriously compromising the viability of American democratic experiment. That same propaganda machine has functioned parallel with the myth uh, perpetuation or social reproductive agenda of the educational system to mask the fundamental socioeconomic, cultural, and moral contradictions in Western, that is European American democracies. African centeredness must be understood in this historical and global perspective. As a worldview, it is not isolated from the events and dynamics of the world. It is informed by the struggles of fellow Africans and by similar struggles of other people. African centeredness is a nationalistic cultural expression of African people that seeks the truthful reconstitution of African history and culture, the transformation of the African man, woman, and child and their world. It aspires ultimately to inform uh, concretely and positively the human condition. Pedagogy is ostensibly concerned with the methodology of teaching. It cannot realistically deal with methodology, however, without examining two additional and related matters. Those matters are concerned with, first, the nature of the teacher's character. The, uh, the the Mwalemo, right? The second matter is concerned with the goals of, the goals or object of the methodology. Three queries to be examined in elaborating an Afrocentric pedagogy then are how, who, and why. Our purpose here is best served by examining the three issues in reverse order. I would start, that means we start with why. Why, a re-examination of pedagogy. The ends or goals of pedagogy will parallel or echo the overall goals of the educational system of which it is a part. That educational system itself must serve to perpetuate the nation state and the underlying cultural reality that spawned it. As a consequence, the assumptions and principles that are fundamental to that nation state, that culture, will be found in the methodology that the agents of the nation state determined to use in enculturating not only its youth, but all its people, and through, very, and through every medium available to it. Education stands in the same relationship to the national culture as childbearing stands to the human species. That is, it assures the perpetuation or permanence and continuity of the species. Hmm. Said. Character composition directly and vitality of education like that of human progeny issue directly from the essence of the parent's body. In the case of education, it issues from the historical cont uh, continuum that lies at the base of culture. African standard education is the codification or systematic expression of African people's will to recover, recreate, and perpetuate our cultural heritage. As a dynamic enterprise, it enriches that culture as it acts to illuminate it, as it attempts to uh, enculturate the people whose collective and, and historical experiences shape and are shaped by that culture. African-centered education speaks to the pan-African world, simultaneously addresses the several national expressions of that world. For Africans in America, African-centered education occasions the resurgence of a national consciousness and an urge for an independent national existence. This consciousness is neither new nor unique. It is, it, it, I'm sorry, its immediate precedent was the period of the 60s. For that, the period of the early 20s, the work of the UNIA, Marcus Garvey. Depths of the original cultural homogeneity of the continent and the gross and non-differentiated inhumanity of the Holocaust of African enslavement 
colonial domination, neocolonialism have all served to establish a potent bond of transoceanic, transnational fraternity among Africans. Consequently, African centered education and African American communities will operate on the same principles and have the same goals as an African centered educational philosophy, Ghana, Zimbabwe, or Zania. The essential goals are genuine self sufficiency and self determination. In each nationality, that education will seek to purge itself and the nation of the perverse effects of current, recent, and remote domination. Language, values, behaviors, images, systems, institutions, and relationships must all be thoroughly and critically uh, re-examined. That education will seek to rediscover the essential truths of its immediate traditional forebears, and ultimately seek to rediscover and reclaim its spiritual and material linkages, the classical civilizations of Kush, Kemet, Nubia, Aksum, and Maru. That process of rediscovery and reclamation is not directed towards simplistic and misguided replication of either traditional African models or European models. The needs of the contemporary world cannot be adequately met by superimposing the mores of classical and traditional societies. And I agree with that 100%. Much of the historical environment that occasion the development of certain philosophical and social constructs no longer exists. The aim of education is not to reenact ancient rituals, values, behaviors, and relationships that are irrelevant in, in, in modern times. It must instead act to illuminate those timeless and dynamic features of the traditional and classical societies. The concept of ma'at, the entire ethical and moral philosophy that surrounds it, is invaluable concept of God and man, the essential cooperative democratic nature of traditional societies and the preeminence of families are timeless values, as is the general holistic conception of the universe. The concept of duty before right is also an essential value of traditional society, duty or right. Beyond those values. So that, that idea of duty before right, that, that makes me think of this conversation only to say and I had on the recent Saturday night shoot the breeze, right? Duty over before what's right. Duty before what's right. So in this conversation, we were talking about the fact that this 96 year old German grandmother who missed a trial, uh, a trial where she, she was brought up on a trial for being an 18 year old typist during uh, the, the, the Uish, um, Uish Holocaust. And, you know, we, we were talking about like, you know, I mean, at 96, man, just let that go, right? Or should you just let that go? But your duty to your people, to your nation, right, comes before what's right. So I'm applying it to this, to this, I'm applying that, that example to this reading, right? Your duty is not to let anyone who has transgressed against you to skip and skate away scot-free. The right thing might probably be, you know, let that old woman pass on and get up out of here, you know, on the physical. But the duty there is she got to get this work before she goes. That's the same duty that we, we should have been being put in on uh, Carolyn, Carolyn Bryant, the woman who caused the murder, the horrific murder of Emmett Teal. That's what we supposed to do currently with the George Zimmermans of the world. And on all these other guys who have killed unarmed black men, women, and children, right? If I could remember the dude's name who, who hemmed up um, our sister Sandra Bland, right? I'll put his name out there too. He was a, some so-called brown person, Hispanic or whatever. But that's the that's where duty to me when I hear duty comes before right. 
that's what I think of to continue born those values that can that continue to be fundamental to traditional societies and that warrant serious and critical attention are the equally meritorious political and social structures with modifications for technological developments, structure and operation of the Ashanti Confederation, the Akan Abusa system, or the Njama Ya It Wika of the Kakuya, or the Induna of the Zulu and other traditional models might be better suited to Africans than the obviously inefficient structures inherited from the colonial powers. Right, now that's something to to look into, to do a little deeper study on the, those those um, those structures, right? And I like the fact that they talk about like you got to technologize, update your technology. This is why you can't be dwelling in the past too much. You have to uh, get the essence of what was done before and modernize it. So it'll be interesting if I could remember to uh, do a deeper dive into all of these on other nights when I'm not reading this book, like on Thursday nights. A common and tragic concession to political and economic expediency amongst Africans is the uncritical adoption and or continuation of European-based systems and philosophies of education, a practice that can only result in continued dependency and inferiorization. Well-intentioned African educators have often turned to so-called progressive or radical education theories and practices that are Eurocentric to fix the problems they experience with Eurocentric models of education. I mean, think of what that sentence just said. Just now. First of all, well-intentioned African educators, problematic, have often turned to so-called progressive or radical education theories and practices that are Eurocentric, problematic, to fix the problems they experience with Eurocentric models of education, absolutely problematic. It's so problematic, I don't understand how, I, how, I, how some of our well and so-called well-intentioned people meant well. Those radical philosophies of Eurocentric thinkers who proclaim themselves to be guided by precepts of social transformation and democracy are, unfor are, are uniformly flawed in their incompetent treatment of cultural difference. Additionally, those well-intentioned Eurocentric theories and theorists continue to assume a universality, a universality, sorry, uh, of cultural response and cultural ideal. Frere, for example, whose philosophy and accomplishments have inspired many, retains an essential Marxist analysis of social history, suffers in as much from the same limitations of Marxism as it relates to culture and race. There is an assumption of universality that, pre, uh, that permeates Frere's writings, which is derivative of a Eurocentric philosophical treatment of the nature of knowledge and the nature of quote unquote man world relationships. This universalist perspective is typical of those so called radical Eurocentric political theorists who routinely understate the significance of national and racial. racial uh, cultural differences. Given the re-emergence of nationalism among Europe's and Asia's ethnic groups within the collapse of communism, the continuing tensions among traditional nations of Africa, this tendency toward understatement should be sufficiently contradicted by reality to be permanently laid to rest. Prayers uh, delineate a nation of problem-posing pedagogy, dialogue as methodology, and cultural action is profound. Its concept of culture anticipates a meta-language, revolutionary pedagogical principles, which is consistent with the general universalist orientation of his work. Freire, Freire describes culture as a superstructure, which can maintain remnants of the past alive in the substructure undergoing revolutionary transformation. 
by the phrase apparent grounding in the concept of unity between subjectivity and objectivity and conscientization, he is nonetheless limited by the Marxist structural paradigm, wherein culture is incidental to social relations and historical dynamics. The fact that he fails to acknowledge or factor into his theories the rich, varied, and vigorous cultural traditions of Africans, sorry, of African Brazilians, 50% plus of the population, can only be attributed to the theoretical limitations of his essential Eurocentric structuralist perspective. Prayer, the past is synonymous with oppression, psychic invasion by the oppressor culture. There is no provision for the dynamic ethnocentric features that shaped social interactions and relationships, features that further shaped traditions, philosophy, morality, art, and spirituality that predated the era of capitalist domination, that are uh, coterminous with it, and that will likely usher in the succeeding era. Per echoes Franz Fanon on the regenerative impact of the liberation struggle on culture and the oppressed. Fanon, however, links the fight for national existence intimately with the fruitfulness, continuous renewal, and deepening of the national culture. Fanon's uh, or Fanon's co uh, concept of culture embraces the concept of broken continuity that is elaborated as well by Amilcar Cabral. One of my favorite folks right here, too. Um, Cabral posits that the dynamic of traditional culture, though absorbed by colonialism, nonetheless provides the wellspring for national resistance and reconstruction. Cabral's call for a process of re-Africanization, the call to re-establish the African historical uh, continuum that undergirds African culture. It is clear that the disruption of that historical continuum explains the current cultural distortions, weakness of the political organizations, and the dependency of the African national economies. Reasons, uh, that, 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 that makes a lot of sense, right? The reasons for the drain of talent that African continental and diaspora nations experience, as well as the graft, nepotism, incompetence, and waste can be found in the educational structure, philosophies, theories, subject content, pedagogy, um, inherited from the colonial powers. Those European colonial powers educated the teachers and administrators for the singular purpose of maintaining Eurocentric thinking and behaviors that continue to serve and protect European uh, economic and political interests. Jamaica, Kenya, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, and other former British colonial nations still employ vestiges of the British system, including British and American texts and curricula. That always is a trip me out too, and we we don't we, because we're not a serious people in general. We don't find that to be a problem. If you're going to teach your children, for God's sakes, at least teach them from your own textbook. The national exams are often still still sent to Britain for evaluation. I've talked about that on the show before. I did when I was a, in high school. I was like an art student, and I did. GCE exam that had to be sent off. My work had to be sent off for some Brit to determine what grade I got. Right? Uh, in my country, we later transitioned away from the GCE to another uh, homegrown exam, but it was based on another British type of exam. Admittedly, it was written by and for Bahamian people, but it was still based on their shit. We can do our, we don't have to base stuff on them. We can create our own uh, rigorous educational system, you know. Where the national system is modeled after the oppressors and carried out in the oppressor's language, where the standards of success are still determined directly and indirectly by the oppressor, Dependency and the inferior and the in, and the inferiorization of the indigenous culture can be the only result. Absolutely. Indeed, it was the design of the colonial powers in view of their 
reduced capacity to contain the political and economic demands of the indigenous population after World War II to protect their interests after independence by the transferal of power to acceptable African collaborators or by muting the radicalism of popular leaders through material temptations and by physical removal where necessary. The objective of an African-centered pedagogy is the illumination and bequeathal of the amassed wisdom and cultural legacy of one generation of the succeeding, of the succeeding generation to ensure the continued and expanded viability of that culture, process must occur within a context of mutual discovery, inspiration, creativity, and reciprocity. An African-centered pedagogy, a pedagogy derived of the African world, historical content, a con continuum, and cultural dynamic endeavors to stimulate and nourish the creative and critical consciousness through study and application, to inculcate a firm and conscious commitment to the reconstruction of true African nationhood, to the restoration of the African historical cultural continuum. It endeavors to create a dynamic and liberated African personality, which is realized as um, Walimu, or teacher, and Owan Funzi, student, interact with each other simultaneously act to transform their environments into dynamic models of liberty, humanism, but in a fashion that reflects their fundamental Africanity. This brings us now to the, the who, uh, character of the teacher. Character of the teacher. What I'll do here is do a quick, sta quick station ID break, and we'll, back, we'll be back on the other side continue to read you are listening to the bitter medicine podcast on kwaz radio this is d webb with the harsh reality podcast ask you to tune in where we tackle the news of the day that affects our community only on kwaz radio peace family this is oni inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions Greetings, fam. Tune in to The Learning Curve with me, the revolutionary matron on KWAZ Radio. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Yes, indeed. Make sure to check out all those other shows, KWAZ Radio. Um, Pro Black Perspective is doing a four part mini series make sure to check it out the revolutionary matron you know she's always uh doing her book club reading uh she also does matron after dark harsh reality podcast i just saw they said they were cooking up something new so make sure to subscribe to their channels uh and like the content when it comes out and make sure to share it that's that's really the important part too um to take this information in and to enjoy a reading or a discussion and not share what you enjoy yourself. That takes five seconds to do, share it to your social media, to share it via email to some good brethren or sister of yours. You know, that's a shame. So you should be sharing this content as well. I think it's very helpful, not only to us, but to everyone when you do so. So who, the character of the Mwalimu? That individual who assumes the role of Mwalimu, or who is so appointed, must be one who was not only studied in the history and culture of our people, but one who is in complete identification with it. The Mwalimu must not only be involved in the study of the culture, but must be involved in a concrete and ongoing way with advancing the culture and our political interests of African people. Molimo comes before his uh, Wanafunzi, or students, as a representative of the whole culture. Molimo is entrusted with the task of inculcating the essential values of that culture and thereby guaranteeing its continuation. Molimo comes to the classroom representing 
in one sense, the limitations of tradition and the existing order. The, the one Ufunzi comes to the classroom representing the new order or unlimited potentiality. Teacher as a representative of the order, of the current order, brings with him or her all the accumulated wisdom of tradition and must seek to impart that wisdom in a way that inspires and fuels the new energy, unlimited potential of the students. The teacher must possess a general command of that accumulated wisdom along with a specific mastery of a chosen area of specialty. Beyond that general competence, the teacher must possess a deep felt and infectious drive to achieve greater command of both the wisdom of tradition and modernity. So that, that basically looks like, you know, if you're a math teacher, cool, you know, bring that, bring that mathematics uh, pedagogy to the table, but don't just be limited to math, be well-versed in all aspects of, of some African culture, right? Bring that wisdom, that African wisdom. And you know, it's been a while since I've done those Yoruba proverb readings, um, maybe we should do some of that soon again. Um, but bring some of that stuff into the mathematics that you teach as well. And, and you know, kind of go back and forth um, with this, you know, being immersed in this, you know, traditional African way of life in all ways. And not just teach the kids your area of expertise, but actually help them along through the subject that you're teaching, help them with their understanding in other subjects. Like there's opportunities in chemistry or there's opportunities in math to talk the history of chemistry, the history of math. So you're talking history, right? <clears throat> there's an opportunity, say, if you're studying chemistry, to talk about chemit, right? And so that, you know, that's kind of how that would look. That's how that should look, you know, to continue. The student must be so motivated by the teacher as to welcome that wisdom as fuel for the long run, not as a burden. That if that wisdom, the cultural treasure and inheritance of the nation is perceived as burdensome, then the teacher and the nation have failed. And the national cultural continuity is in jeopardy. Teaches the essential conduit, a nexus between tradition, the potential of the nation. Hmm. Hmm. <clears throat> Let me add something here too. One of the biggest shames I see in society in general, and you could say maybe that's European society. One of the biggest shames I see is that you have these grade school teachers who are making peanuts to teach. You have college professors, adjuncts, who are making peanuts to teach. Some of us teaching in areas that these kids will need as prerequisites for med school. And some of these kids go on, especially these European kids, they go on and they go to med school and they go on to make the big bucks off of your knowledge, quite frankly. Yes, they had to work with the knowledge and break it down into, into manageable bites, so to speak, to understand it, right? They had to thoroughly understand it that way. They had to digest it, so to speak. But it's sort of work on the expertise of oftentimes of these adjunct instructors. And you could see, you could go on YouTube and look up these or the, the New York Times, or look up the stories and how poorly uh, these adjuncts are taught. And most of the most of the instructors now in colleges are adjuncts, right? Folks with PhDs, folks with master's degrees, who are teaching and not making much money at all. So in fact, a lot of them have to teach at multiple schools, multiple courses, just to be able to make ends meet. There was a popular story with a black adjunct instructor. She was a PhD holder as well. I forgot where she was now. Can't remember what school she was at, but struggling and was on, and was like on food stamps too, or something like that. Just wild shit. 
So to use the, the, the terminology or the, the idea that the revolutionary matron pushes often when she speaks on her platform, The Learning Curve, uh, you got to pay your thinkers, you have to pay your teachers. If the teacher is the essential conduit, a nexus between tradition and the potential of a nation, who do you think you need to compensate well who's at that nexus position? Practice reciprocity. You can't build nations off of the backs of folks who are here to uh, uh, take tradition and turn it into power by way of nationhood and don't, and don't compensate them. Every NBA player you see out here making millions of dollars have had these High school teachers that they always look up to, high school PE teachers and whatnot, these guys ain't making nothing. These guys have shown up in people's history classes in college and literature class and all that stuff, and the, t the instructors looking at them knowing full well Derek Rose, for example, with his dumb self, is going to go and make millions of dollars. Day one, but that's the European system. And unfortunately, we tend to follow their systems too much. The teacher should be someone held highly, but in, in particularly in black society, teachers aren't held highly. Y'all put the, pri the, 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 the priest and the rev and the pastor, that's who y'all hold high. Y'all give 10 plus percent of your income to these folks. And people tend to think it's just one or two guys, these pastors who are making money, no. All of these little churches you see that pop up in these little neighborhoods like here in Brooklyn, those, those guys are making some money off that stuff. just for them to indoctrinate you in some European ideology. You gotta start holding, if your teachers are gonna be fully committed and, and immersed in African tradition, and we've identified that these guys are the conduits, the teachers are the conduits to us getting to a place of power, a place of nationhood. You have to put it in your minds today to compensate those people. Teacher can only be effective in fulfilling that task if he or she is an active participant in that working collective that is devoted to the cultural, political, and economic development of the African community. The teacher must bring enthusiasm, conviction, ideological clarity, moral integrity, and courage, as well as knowledge to the teaching learning environment. Now listen to all those things the teacher must bring. Practice reciprocity. What are you going to bring the teacher? The latent messages and, inf and information shared by the teacher through physical nuance, voice pattern, and tone, hairstyle, dress, and character are as important to the effective teaching learning environment as the structured lessons, which I agree. But we can't have them investing out of pocket for this type of, and we're not compensating them. If the teacher is deficient in either area, the respect of the students and the, and the efficacy of the teacher learner encounter will be compromised. You know what also compromises that encounter? See the notes I just dropped within the last two minutes. Given the critical role that the teacher must play in the maintaining and enhancing the national culture, 
It is no wonder that in classical African civilizations and in still viable traditional societies, the higher or core knowledge was entrusted only to its most esteemed elders and spiritual leaders. The effect of African centered teaching, learning environment includes the immediate relationship of teacher and student, teach, uh, teacher and student respectively. That environment extends to and includes the active involvement of the family, the school as a community focal point, and the community itself. Each of the several active elements, teacher, student, family, school, and community, must be culturally and ideologically aligned. The cohesive and motivating factors that energize the environment are the shared identity, values, language, and goals. In some, the African nationalistic consciousness and socio-political development of the African community. Each of the several active elements are arranged so as to augment and reinforce the cultural context of the educative process. Parental involvement is made mandatory by school policy and is facilitated by the organization of the school and the communitarian management philosophy of the school administrator. Wazazi, or the parents, are expected to be intimately involved in the student's intellectual development and are provided with opportunities for intellectual growth themselves. And that's what I'm talking about. You're not creating an African-centered education just for the students. You're creating an African-centered education for the students and the parents to both be co-learners. Parents are expected to maintain an enthusiastic commitment and involvement in cultural activities and with other uh, parents and families. Parents' involvement in school management is facilitated through representation on appropriate committees, involvement in school support and development projects, and the ready accessibility of information. Parents or families should receive periodic narrative evaluations of their participation in school affairs. And you, you know, parents uh, participating in like PTAs is known that parents don't do it. Just like it's known that black folks try their hardest not to participate in the jury system. And then we wonder why shit doesn't go our way. Parents' presence in the classroom itself, in a functional capacity, is vitally important in reinforcing the linkage between school and family. And this is why I'm so big on the independent homeschools, right? Or the, the weekend schools and stuff like that because that's the time when parents for the most part would be off from any job would be home with children who are off from this public uh food system and that's the time with parents and students right as well as someone who's dedicated and has been uplifted to the to the to the to the position of teacher should also be involved in it as well, right? It is imperative that they perceive their role as essential and substantive. School itself might see itself, the school itself must see itself as the hub of dynamic community, which provides a variety of experiences for cultural development and reinforcement, as well as the opportunities for the application and reinforcement of academic principles. Within the classroom itself, the teacher must maintain a personal presence of authority and control, but with compassion, and sensitivity. That's what just that's what your kids that's what our kids don't get in the public school system. That presence consists of a demeanor that demands order and discipline, yet encourages the pursuit of liberty. This essential presence is further characterized by self confidence, enthusiasm for learning and teaching cultural awareness and commitment. This presence will be apparent to the students and the students always alert to vibes and the nuances of unspoken language will respond in a way that ensures a productive and invigorated teaching or learning environment. The initial response of the students in the classroom is usually one of clear resistance and challenge. Indeed, the student's demeanor is always characterized by some resistance that's why I said children resist. 
a certain measure which is necessary and beneficial to the teaching learning environment. That resistance is a function of both psycho-affective development and a manifestation of oppositional behavior, born of the repressive socio-political and cultural condition of African people. Some of the immediate resources of that resistance include the increasing fragmentation of the community and atomization of the family as a consequence of the individualistic propaganda of, co of commercial interests. Other sources of that resistance include the prominence of non-African and non-community sources of information and values, particularly the infatuation with violence, prevalence of disregard for the traditional sources of authority within the family and community. The resistance that the perceptive teacher observes in the students goes beyond simple obstinacy, marginal self-motivation, negative attention-getting, or simple mischief-making, though it may be masked by these secondary behaviors. It is the task, then, of the teacher to facilitate the redirection of the student's energy away from reactionary individual challenge and toward the social challenge of cultural political analysis, study and reconstruction of the African world, given a strong, cohesive and functioning family or school or community environment and a capable and creative teacher, that resistance, like seedlings before the last spring frost, can be nurtured and shepherded into prominence. And that resistance is so nurtured and thereafter focused and defined through African-centered dialogue Oh, sorry, di di dialogic methodology, that resistance can manifest itself in the creative, irrepressible, and revolutionary spirit of a Harriet Tubman or Yah Sentawa, or the force of a Marcus, Malcolm, Martin, or George Jackson. Again, I want to stress it because I, I don't see where they're stressing this here right now. Maybe they do at some uh, later point. But I want to stress the idea that the practice reciprocity. By the way, if you're listening to this video right now, if you're in the chat, listen to the playback. It could be today, tomorrow, next week, next year, five years, 10 years, 20 years from now, hit the like button. It's kind of wild to me that folks have to be told to hit the like button. Usually when I'm live and I say, hey, guys, hit the like button, that's when I start to see the likes go up. But if you, once you enter the room, show that you're present by hitting the like button. Practice reciprocity. Among the male students during the pre-adolescent adolescent years, that resistance and the accompanying urge to redefine perceived problematic situations is further intensified by the emergence of the quote-unquote warrior spirit. It is the emergence of this virile and expansive warrior spirit that in traditional societies occasioned the prolonged isolation of the man-child. The purpose of that isolation was the inculcation of self-discipline, self self-awareness, knowledge, and appreciation of tradition and the boundaries and needs of social order. The absence of that socially mandated training, and discipline and order, and of structured avenues for the application of that warrior spirit was clear to our ancestors that the spirit would be self-destructive and would indeed disrupt the very fiber of the society. So that's why we had those rites of passage. The current epidemic of self-destructive violence among our young males that now paralyzes our communities is a direct consequence of inadequate institutional capacity to direct that warrior spirit. There are three directions possible for the manifestation of the resistance of spirit. They are A, undisciplined and wanton mischief and self-destruction that serves to sustain our cultural, uh, sorry, that serves to sustain our collective powerlessness and repression. B, an aggressive accommodationism that acts as an agent of Eurocentric hegemony to further entrench our subordinate social status. This is what we see every day. Or C, a medium for attaining national liberation. It is the mission of the teacher acting within the collective of family, school, and community to recognize that resistance, that spirit, and to heighten and focus it within a valuing context that is African-centered. 
Therefore, in collaboration with family, school, and community, teacher must channel that spirit to the purposes of national liberation and nation building. Let me ask you guys a quick question at this point right here. Based on what we just read, do you guys remember, um, this might have been one of the first movies I saw him in. Uh, let me make sure I have the right name. Do you guys um, remember that movie? I remember seeing it in an actual movie theater with Morgan Freeman called Lean On Me. Now, of course, that film Lean On Me wasn't particularly uh, African-centered or at all African-centered. But do you feel like... Um, you feel that Morgan Freeman's character, do you feel like, who was based on a real teacher, by the way, right? Um, Joe Clark, if I'm not mistaken, the guy's name was. And if I'm not mistaken, he recently, he not too long ago passed away too, right? Uh, do you think Joe Clark would fit the description of this African-centered teacher that we just read about here, right? Like, it, it, like it, it's the only thing missing in that story is the African-centeredness, right? You guys let me know. Uh, as indicated before, the teacher brings the accumulated wisdom of tradition and contemporary society to the classroom. Teacher's historical, cultural, and political knowledge must be comprehensive and the mastery of some particular area, uh, area of study must also be complete. Teacher must be generally knowledgeable of the history of Africa, of the major events and themes that characterize that history. He or she must additionally be knowledgeable of the environment of Africans in world history, as well as the current environment, sorry, the current involvement of Africans in the specific discipline being taught. That history, the African cultural ideological construct it engenders provide the context for the skills and processes that are the objectives of the instruction. Problem solving and inquiry skills in math and science can be developed using social, historical, or technical situations that involve African people. Study of political parties could begin with a comparative study of the single and seminal multi-party systems in African states prices of drugs and homicides in our communities, or the continuing legacy of instability among continental states are sociopolitical problems that can be used to facilitate those thinking skills and processes. Problems of agricultural production, economic systems, and health issues on the continent and in the diaspora are areas particularly rich for math and science studies, since the abundance of scientific data, technological options, lends itself to research synthesis, hypothesizing, and application skills. Critical and creative thinking, comprehension, decision-making in the arts, literature, and the social sciences can be developed using information and examples from the African historical cultural experience. Using experiences from the real world, the subject area is demystified and brought within the realm of the possible for the students. Real life and historical African experiences identify and connect teacher, oh, sorry, the students and the African cultural historical con continuum as they facilitate critical and creative analyses. Discovery of social relations. This real life context facilitates the interaction of the teacher and the students, which must at all times be characterized by a reciprocity that occasions intellectual discovery and development by both. I'm going to end tonight's reading there. And we pick up next time, we're gonna talk about how, the methods and the goals. And I think that's actually a good thing that we, so now we have the profile on what the teacher looks like. We have a profile for what the environment of teacher and students looks like, right? Uh, the expectations, if you will. 
And now we'll talk about the methodology that leads to the expectations or the goals that we want. And I think the methods are important because like I said, you and I, all of us, anyone who's listening to this, anyone who's ever read this book or who, who's ever thought about or cared about African-centered education, all of us have to become teachers now. All of the adults become equally the teacher and in some cases equally the student. As parents, we have to be, we have to be teachers and we have to be students. And as teachers, we have to be fully immersed, but we need to know how do we go about, because a lot of times it's things are easier said than done. But if we have examples of people carrying out certain tried and true methods to achieve the goals that you want from an African-centered education, then we need to take our time and go through the methodology. Okay. Before I go, I want to remind you guys that KWAZ Radio is looking to bring on some new podcasts, some new shows to the radio network. In particular, we want to tackle things like African spirituality, uh, African politics, economics, African culture, relationships. Etc. Maybe even a debate show, um, as well. So, if you, anyone you know, is a small podcaster who's dealing with these types of areas of discourse, reach out to KWAZ Radio, pitch your idea, and uh, let's see if we can get you to join the rest of us on the network. Have you ever considered joining KWAZ Radio? Each of our hosts shares their unique perspective with you. You might have a perspective that needs to be shared. If that's true, hit us up at kwaz.radio at gmail.com. What are you going to do? What you going to do? Yes, indeed. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Uh, hopefully, practice reciprocity. Speaking of which, um, you guys can donate to the show. I'm always trying to improve the show, improve the Discord. You can do that in a couple of different ways. You can, um, you can support the show by purchasing a t-shirt. Uh, give thanks to the Revolutionary Matron from the Learning Curve podcast. She set that up for all of us on KWAZ Radio so far. Um, the link is down in the chat, also down in, in the description of this video. Can support the show by purchasing a t-shirt you can support the show by making a donation directly to the show at bitter dollar sign bitter meds m-e-d-z b-i-t-t-e-r m-e-d-z right you can donate that way as well and when you get a shirt make sure wear it take pictures in it send it to us if you buy a harsh reality podcast t-shirt send it to you know send a picture to them you rocking their their t-shirt um the good way of letting folks know that you appreciate what we do and that hopefully they will also tune in and appreciate what we do as well. What I will do now is I will be back on Thursday reading a paper, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And on Saturday, you know what it is, it's the Saturday Night Shoot the Breeze, also at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You guys, to join the Discord, the link is at the top of the chat and down in the description. Join the Discord, find the area for submitting Shoot the Breeze topics, submit them, and we'll have a lively conversation. I might even have a guest or two, some folks from KWAZ Radio might hop on, as you saw it was the case with Onitase recently, right? So uh, post your topics and we'll discuss them on Saturday Night Shoot the Breeze. 
I hope you guys are enjoying this reading of nationhood. We're taking our time to go through it because it's necessary to do so. And I hope you guys are writing down notes or taking screen grabs of, of areas of the book that you think is super important, something to go back to in the future, right, and build on. Anyway, till next time, you guys be good. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast with your host, Koku. If you like what you just heard, we hope you pass along our web address, bittermedicineblogs.com, to your friends and colleagues, and share our show to all your social media. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. This has been a KWAZ radio production. Join us next time for another session of the Beta Medicine Podcast. Follow us on Facebook at Beta Medicine Show, Twitter, Beta Meds, Tumblr, Beta Meds, Instagram, Beta Medicine.